Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Justin Meyer. I'm the Director of Development for the Department of Neurosurgery. Thank you for joining us today. We hope that we find you all safe and well. This is your first time joining us for Fridays with Friedlander. We've covered many remarkable topics by incredible expert UPMC and University of Pittsburgh neurosurgeons, researchers, and current and former trainees. If you've missed any of our past presentations and would like to view them, please visit the dedicated Fridays with Friedlander page on our department website at www.neurosurgery.pit.edu. All of our attendees' mics are muted, but you can type a question into the Q&A chat box and we'll try to get to as many as we can in our allotted time. If you have any questions after today's event or if you're watching the recorded version and have questions or comments, please email me at jrm233 at pit.edu. This week, we're highlighting one of our extraordinary and very accomplished neurosurgery researchers, Dr. Sean Eagle. As for that, Dr. Freelander, thank you, and please take it away. Well, thank you very much, uh, Justin. A uh, pleasure to be uh, with you all uh, today. Uh, today, we're going to uh, shift uh, um, topics uh, a little bit and talk about, uh, you know, concussions and consequences of uh, concussions. Uh, our center here at the University of Pittsburgh over many decades has been a, a leader in really uh, developing new trends in the management and evaluation and follow-up of uh, uh, patients that uh, have concussions for many uh, different uh, reasons. Uh, right now, it's a group uh, led by one of our neurosurgeons, uh, Dr. David Oconquo, uh, who leads uh, really a fantastic uh, group of uh, individuals in, the, in the managing and developing uh, protocols, doing a lot of research, and uh, importantly, just taking care of patients here. And, uh, you know, one of the things that is neurosurgeons, often we manage the acute uh, episode of a uh, trauma, particularly the severe trauma. Regrettably, many patients die, but the ones that survive, many end up with very, very significant uh, disability. And, uh, you know, the follow-up is, is, is a whole other, um, you know, course of events which need to be managed uh, properly to optimize the the uh, overall outcome of uh, these uh, patients. Uh, UPMC in general, in collaboration with the Concussion Center, uh, really uh, has been a leader in both understanding uh, the consequences of trauma, but really developing uh, novel approaches uh, to to understand what to do with these patients. Now, one of the things is that if you don't know what the natural history, what happens, where are the red flags, then you don't know where to intervene uh, early. Um, Dr. Sean uh, Eagle uh, is a recent uh, recruit uh, to our department. Uh, he did his undergraduate at uh, Denison, did his PhD here at the uh, University of, uh, of uh, Pittsburgh, and did his uh, postdoc uh, in the concussion center uh, as well and joined our department in January, really uh, starting a uh, uh, phenomenal uh, work. Uh, uh, the work that he'll discuss uh, today really attracted a significant amount of attention because of uh, the importance of uh, the topic. So, Sean, thank you so much uh, for joining us uh, today and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you, Dr. Friedlander, for that introduction and the chance to talk to you today. Uh, the title of my talk is Interaction and Association of Race and Ethnicity, Sex and Sport-Related Concussion on Depression History and Suicide Attempts in United States Youth. Uh, just for quick disclaimers, I have no conflicts of interest related to this presentation, and this work has recently been published in JAMA Network Open. The, DO, the DOI and the title of the work is there for reference. So we all know traumatic brain injury is a global health issue, um, but maybe less appreciated is the rate of mood disorders and suicidal behaviors that occur after TBI, especially in adolescents. Uh, many factors have independently been associated with both TBI and suicidal behaviors, things like minority race or ethnicity compared to white race, uh, biological sex, and depression status. Um, but at the date of the publication uh, that we're talking about here today, no other studies had investigated how these factors may influence each other in order to affect suicidal behaviors. Quick background on some of the uh, research that's available out there. 
uh, non-white race and ethnicities experience disparities in concussion uh, care seeking, reporting, and management. That's been repeatedly uh, reported. Notable health disparities in mental health and suicidal behaviors uh, exist for race and ethnicities in the United States. Uh, biological sex is a clear factor that that seems to affect both concussions and suicide rates, uh, such as females attempt suicide at higher rates than males, uh, but males experience concussion at much higher rates than females do in the US. Um, depression is also an epidemic issue in the United States and occurs in approximately 20% of adolescent, adolescents who suffer a concussion and depression status is, is obviously a strong predictor of suicide attempts. And it seems likely based off of all this evidence that an interaction between these variables may, may augment uh, or influence suicide attempts. Um, but no study to date, as I said, had looked at the interaction of all these variables in a multifactorial model. So the purpose of this study was to determine the rates of concussion history and suicide attempts within different race ethnicity groups when stratified by sex. Uh, secondarily, we also looked at univariable logistic regression models to investigate the association of these variables to reporting a recent suicide attempt within the last year. And lastly, we used a data mining decision tree algorithm to investigate the existence of an interaction between these variables in a way that might influence a suicide attempt within the previous year. The data from this study come from something called the Youth Risk Behavior Surveillance System, or YRBSS. That's a biannual serial survey given to a representative sample of US youth regarding their risk behaviors. And it's about a 100 question survey that just analyzes risk behaviors over time. And it's sponsored by the CDC. Uh, the primary outcome comes from this question. During the past 12 months, how many times did you actually attempt suicide? And we recorded that into a binary variable where zero is the answer or one includes however many times they had attempted suicide in the past year. Secondary outcomes were the, come from the question, during the past 12 months, how many times did you have a concussion from playing a sport or being physically active? Uh, during the past 12 months, did you ever feel so sad or hopeless almost every day for two weeks or more in a row that you stopped doing some usual activities? And they also self-reported race and ethnicity uh, based on these categories, which are provided from the YRBSS, American Indian or Alaska Native, Asian, Black, Hispanic, Latino, Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander or white, and sex was female or male. We also included age in those categories, less than 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, or 18 years of age. Our statistical analysis used a univariate logistic regression approach um, in which we built the association of single variables on the outcome. For this study, the outcome was suicide attempt. And then we put one multivariate logistic regression model together with all the potential predictors uh, included to investigate the association of all these variables together in the same model on suicide attempts. And lastly, we use something called CHAD, which stands for Chi-Square Automatic Interaction Detection. It's a data mining decision tree model that's used to investigate the interactions of these variables on the outcome. And whether or not you know this, you interact with decision tree models pretty much every day. If you use social media or if you use companies like Amazon, uh, they will use it to identify your characteristics and what you might be more likely to purchase, for example, based on your past purchase history. Um, and the, the primary advantage of the CHAD data mining algorithm is the automatic detection of interactions between these variables and also within variables that have multiple categories like race and ethnicity. So I'll tell the story uh, of this study based off the tables and figures um, that were included in the publication. Over 28,400 kids uh, came from this study. Um, age was was pretty uh, separate out, except for the less than or equal to 12, pretty evenly separated, and greater than or equal to 16. 
uh, more than 50 or 51 percent rather uh, of the study were were female sex and you can see nearly 50 percent of the sample was white uh, after that 24 percent were hispanic latino and 17 percent were black american indian or alaskan native multiracial or native hawaiian or pacific islander each were represented by less than five percent of the total sample and you can also see here that 3874 uh, participants reported having a concussion in the previous year whereas 1904 participants reported a suicide attempt in the previous year table two is kind of busy so i'll help explain this for you this breaks down the rate of concussion here and suicide attempt by by sex within the different race or ethnicities so male race or ethnicities are on the top and female are on the bottom and just some highlights i want to point out are on the left the highest rate of concussion amongst the males was american indian alaskan native at nearly one in four uh, the highest rate of concussion amongst females was the native hawaiian pacific islander group at greater than one in four now uh, the highest rate of suicide attempt amongst males was found also in the american indian alaskan native group at nearly 12 percent and the highest rate of suicide attempt amongst females were multiracial race ethnicity females at nearly 14 percent so this is the results of our univariate logistic regression models uh, just a few things to point out here are that obviously depression history was the largest predictor of suicide attempt at nearly an increased odds of eight and a half concussion history increased odds for a suicide attempt by 59 percent and female sex increased the odds for a suicide attempt by 81 percent uh, within the race and ethnicities and all of these here were compared to the white respondents in the study american indian or alaskan native kids had a hundred percent increased odds of a suicide attempt compared to white people uh, followed by multiracial at 66 percent and black and hispanic latino were tied at 21 percent looking at all these variables together in one model our multivariate logistic regression model found that higher age was a significant significantly related to lesser odds slightly lesser odds of a suicide attempt depression history the odds raised up to 11.2 for increased odds of suicide attempt concussion history dropped slightly to 33 percent and female sex dropped to 23 percent uh, the three race ethnicities below were retained in the model based off of statistical significance compared to our white respondents and still american indian or alaskan native had 70 percent increased odds of a suicide attempt uh, multiracial kids had a 46 percent increased odds and interestingly hispanic latino kids had 11 percent fewer odds of attempting suicide in the previous year compared to white respondents. So this is one of two de decision trees from the study. Uh, in this, because depression history is such an overwhelming predictor of suicide attempt, we looked at the outcome as suicide attempt with depression history and suicide attempt without depression history and created two decision trees from that. Uh, the overall accuracy of the model you see here was 84.3%. And at the top, you see the total number of kids who had a suicide attempt with depression history that was 1497. the primary predictor associated with that outcome was having greater or equal to one concussions in the past year that increased your odds for suicide attempt with depression history by 31 percent looking at this looking at this side of the tree alone if you had one or more concussions in the previous year being black hispanic latino or multiracial increased your odds for suicide attempt with depression history by 59 percent and within that subgroup being female increased the risk for suicide attempt by 34 percent all told having yeses to all three of these questions increased your odds for a suicide attempt by 104 percent that's the highest risk group that we found in this study Conversely, over here, if you had zero concussions in the previous year, 
biological sex was the most important variable, excuse me, um, whereas females increased your risk slightly over males. And within that group, if you were American, Indian, or Alaskan Native, multiracial, or Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander, your total odds of increased risk for suicide attempts with depression history was 52%. This is our second decision tree model. Uh, suicide attempt without depression history, which represented 407 respondents in this study. The overall accuracy of this was 97.8% in identifying a relationship between the outcome and the predictors. On this side, if you were Alaskan Native, American Indian, Black, Native Hawaiian, or Pacific Islander, your increased odds of a suicide attempt without reporting subsequent depression history was 89%. If you were in the other group of racial ethnicities, Asian, Hispanic, Latino, multiracial, or white, concussion became relevant to the outcome. So your odds of reporting a suicide attempt without depression history increased by 29% if you also reported a concussion in the past year. So overall, uh, this study found three sociocultural and clinical phenotypes for reporting a suicide attempt in the previous year. And the three top ones are listed here. Being Black, Hispanic, Latino, or multiracial uh, race ethnicity, having female sex, and concussion and depression history within the previous year was the largest risk for reporting a suicide attempt. Secondarily, if you were American Indian, Alaskan Native, multiracial, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, uh, and also reported female sex and depression within the previous year, but no concussion within the previous year, increased your odds of a suicide attempt. And lastly, the, from the previous slide, being American Indian, Alaskan Native, Black, Hispanic, or Latino race ethnicity, and no depression history, was the third highest phenotype for risk of a suicide attempt in the previous year. Strengths of this study are a large sample size. We had around 28,500 kids in this study over two years. And we also used the decision tree algorithm, which I just showed you to look at the interaction of these variables. And as I said before, the primary strength of using that algorithm is that it looks at interactions between different variables such as biological sex and concussion history, but also within individual variables. As you saw, race ethnicity had seven different groups. It can automatically group within that variable to look at the difference in risk between race ethnicities. Another advantage of this study was we looked at race ethnicities separately. Uh, most of the previous work, especially in concussion, groups uh, individual race ethnicities and compares them to white to white kids who have a concussion. Um, obviously, that that dilutes the information that's available, as all different kids of races and ethnicities have different experiences and will obviously experience concussion differently. Lastly, over fifty percent of this sample was female, which is important. A recent study um, that came out in the British Journal of Sports Medicine found that eighty percent of systematic review data in concussion was male only, and 40% of studies don't report female athletes at all in their studies looking at concussion research. And this is just a clip from the Washington Post, which had a recent article about that study. Limitations from the study that are important are this is a cross-sectional study, and so we cannot determine causality between the predictors. And what I mean by that, is we don't know the timeline of when these things happen. So we don't know if you had a concussion and then got depressed and then attempted suicide, or if you were depressed and because you were depressed, you were kind of acting irrationally, maybe got a concussion and then attempted suicide. We can't tell that from this data. Uh, there was also missing data in this, in this data set that could have improved the models that we didn't have access to, such as a pre-existing psychiatric diagnosis uh, different stress levels or adverse life experiences. All kids come from different socioeconomic statuses or family levels of education, and also whether or not they had insurance. And, be, and because this survey, uh, parents have to opt in to allow their kid to respond 
there may be some response bias of who was allowed to respond and who wasn't, but we're unable to tell uh, who, who opted out and who opted in. Very important future directions for this study, uh, mostly related to the study design. We urgently need a large nationally represented prospective study of these children and adolescents to uncover the temporal relationships between these issues. Doing so might help us identify potential treatment targets for earlier interventions to lower risk for these suicide attempts. It's a crucially important research question and a public health issue in the United States. Uh, we need deeper investigations into the severely underrepresented upper underrepresented minority groups, specifically these three, which had interesting findings that popped out in this study, being American Indian, Alaskan Native, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander, or multiracial. Lastly, we need to understand the differences between biological sexes within individual minority groups and how that might relate to depression, concussion history, and suicide attempts. I'd like to sincerely thank my authorship team. Uh, each of these people brought diverse experiences and expertise that made this work possible and influenced the outcome and made it what it was. So thank you very much to my co-authors and I'll take any questions if you have this. Thank you, Dr. Eagle. What an incredible presentation. Uh, we're going to begin our the Q&A portion of our presentation. We'll try to answer as many as we can in our allotted time. Dr. Freelander, would you like to start us off? Sure. Uh, thank you very much. Really uh, very interesting uh, presentation and uh, impactful in terms of <clears throat> its uh, results. You mentioned uh, towards the end, uh, you know, the relationship between the time frame of the onset of depression versus the concussive uh, event. Um, what, what, uh, given that depression really is such a strong driver of, uh, of uh, what you saw with the uh, suicide attempts, can what do you think in terms of, I'm sure there's going to be some people that are depressed before and after, and, but how, how do you think the interplay between depression and concussion is going to play in this whole scene? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, there are two factors really at play. There, having a, a depression history before you have a concussion is a really strong predictor of two things. One, it's a strong predictor of prolonged outcome after after a concussion, so it takes longer for those people to fully recover. And two, it's a dramatically strong predictor of mood related symptoms after you have a concussion. So knowing that pre existing psychological uh, diagnosis before concussion is really critical in this age group, uh, and I would have really liked to have that for the for these analyses. Uh, also, secondarily, there's there's a very high rate of depressive symptoms after having a concussion in adolescence. I, I've seen estimates up to 40, 50 percent in some studies. Um, so it really could hit you before or after a concussion and affect the outcome here. Yeah, thank you. Uh, what what are you what what are your hopes of uh, outcomes uh, from the study? Obviously, um, you know a, a key component is going to be to flag uh individuals at high risk of a uh, suicide but how do you how do you see this playing out and i like obviously there's more work that needs to be done but your findings are pretty strong already yeah uh, my primary message for this is to is to urge sports medicine practitioners or parents in general who have active kids to screen for depression there there's there's many freely available short screeners out there um, it can save kids lives especially if they have characteristics that i pointed out in this study such as certain race ethnicities um, having a recent concussion being female those things have repeatedly been associated uh, with suicide attempts that that's the most critical thing um, obviously we had a very huge sample size from this study at over twenty-eight thousand, but we just we just so badly need a, a well-designed perspective trial to look at how these things, what are your risks for depression, uh, for suicide attempts after a concussion, and how those things might be changed by race, ethnicities, and biological sex. Th those are very hard studies to get funded because they cost so much money and uh, a lot of time and effort, but it, it's becoming such an issue in the United States, especially after the pandemic, that this the time is now to do that study. 
Yeah, no, I uh, totally agree. Very, very important uh, work to be done. Um, Justin, any questions? Uh? We do, Dr. Freelander. Thank you. Um, I'll start off with just a, a comment from an audience member. Uh, congratulations on your latest publication. You're doing very important, impactful work. So again, congratulations, uh, Dr. Eagle. Thank you. Uh, question for you. Um, do you think a reluctance to report concussion skews stats among st certain groups? That's a really good question. Um, I would say for this, it, I would I would suggest that it would not um, because you're filling out a paper survey and turning it in or you're filling out a survey on a computer. Uh, I have found I don't have any data to back this up, but I have found that if you're just answering something on a computer, you're more likely to be truthful than if somebody asks you the question and you have to respond to them face to face. Uh, I would guess that the data in this study is fairly accurate regarding concussion history. Excellent, thank you. Uh, what do you think might be the underlying reason why certain groups have shown higher suicide risks? That's one of the things I talk about a little bit in um, in the paper itself is that second decision tree finding is really interesting. Concussion is only relevant to the minority group that had less risk for suicide attempts with the, with uh, without depression history. So what is it about being American Indian or Alaskan Native or being black or native Hawaiian Pacific Islander in the United States as a kid that that causes you to attempt suicide without even having depression? You know, what does that say about the United States and and the way we're we're treating people or handling things that that attempting suicide is such a high risk for for those groups specifically compared to these groups. Excellent, thank you. Um, it seems like some real top notch concussion research comes out of Pittsburgh. What makes make what makes Pittsburgh the place? <laughs> wow, what a really good question. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm obviously biased, but some of the best stuff that's ever come out on concussion comes from the University of Pittsburgh. Um, Dr. Mickey Collins and Dr. Anthony Contos, Dr. Mark Level deserve a lot of deserve most of the credit for that and building a team that that looks at concussion in a new way. They specifically Dr. Mark Lovell, who was a neuropsychologist who started the concussion clinic and then uh, handed it off to Dr. Mickey Collins. They pioneered a more active and earlier approach to concussion and a more specific approach to individual issues after a concussion. Not everyone experiences a concussion the same way, and that was a really novel concept in the 2000s, and Dr. Collins deserves most of the credit for pushing that forward um, across the country and across the world. Uh, and from that has come uh, research investments from the Department of Defense, from the NIH, from other groups uh, around the country, and Dr. Contos has produced some really great research from that as well. That's excellent, thank you. Uh, what are the different symptoms between traumatic brain injury and concussion? That's a really good question. So the classic way to describe traumatic brain injury is three categories. Mild traumatic brain injury, which is equivalent to a concussion, moderate traumatic brain injury, or severe traumatic brain injury. Um, those classifications we're learning from, from work uh, pi pioneered and offered by Dr. Okonkwo and Dr. Jeff Manley through Track TBI um, found or, or just suggest that categories don't really make any sense in traumatic brain injury. It's a spectrum. It's so heterogeneous. Everyone experiences it differently. Um, but in general, a mild traumatic brain injury, if you see that term in the literature, um, is the equivalent to a concussion. Uh, and so the symptoms would the symptoms would be the same. On the more severe end of a concussion, it really depends on the location of the bleed within the brain that would affect the symptoms that you have. Excellent. Thank you for clearing that up for us. Appreciate that. Um, sort of uh, one last question here for you, Dr. Eagle, kind of a fun one, I guess, to end on. Um, it seems like, I'm sorry, uh, I'm a Pitt student studying neuroscience. I'm really enjoying my time here. What was your experience like? Uh, my experience was, was great. I, I got a 
PhD here. I did my postdoc here and I wanted to stay here uh, to continue my research. I believe this is one of the premier health science research universities in the world, much less the United States. Um, and based on the long history of brain injury research and pioneering new ways forward for for patients and ways to help people get better um, that was already here. There's no place you should study neuroscience uh, more than here. And that's my perspective, especially if you're interested in brain injury. That's really great. Thank you. And thank you again for being here with us today. Excellent presentation. Thank you to all of our attendees. Again, if you have any questions or would like to learn uh, about ways to support the work that you just heard, please reach out to me at jrm233 at pitt.edu. Uh, so happy to stay connected with our neurosurgery friends like this. Uh, thanks again, Dr. Eagle. Dr. Freelander, would you like to send us off for the day, please? Sure, but uh, before that, I have uh, one one additional uh, question for for Dr. Eagle. Uh, you know, you touched upon uh, the fact that you know different individuals can have mild, uh, moderate, or severe TBI, and then there's sequela. But then, as it pertains to um, risk for suicide, as as an example, are um, you think that be worthwhile, or is anybody looking at biomarkers either? blood biomarkers or imaging biomarkers of why different people react in different ways to to the trauma that's a great question and something i'm trying to get into more uh you know if you pay attention to the news the world is obsessed with a blood biomarker that diagnoses concussion um, everyone has been trying to chase after that for 10 or 15 years with not too much success until recently uh, but what I would suggest to the scientific community in general is that we need to be more targeted in the biomarkers we're looking for. Most people with concussion have some sort of sequelae that needs that needs addressing, and we need biomarkers for those things so we can intervene quickly after a concussion uh, after a concussion has happened. So uh, the, that is a brand new area of research, but it needs to be where we where we go to really move this thing forward. No, I, I, I totally agree with you. And uh, obviously different people react differently to a similar kind of a concussion, more long-term inflammation, a more long-term uh, neurotransmitter uh, changes. So obviously very, very uh, active, exciting, and very important uh, research moving forward. So again, uh, thank you for your talk, your work. It's uh, great that you've uh, joined uh, our department. Uh, and uh, again, thank you for, for being uh, with us uh, uh, today. Our next uh, 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 episode is going to be with uh, Dr. Marco Capogrosso. You've heard from him before. He's going to provide us some really exciting update on uh, work he's been doing with uh, spinal cord stimulation and other research uh, studies that uh, he's uh, really transforming the the world for people with uh, motor disabilities. So again, uh, uh, September 2nd, uh, he'll be on. And again, uh, thank you very much uh, for joining us. Uh, have a great uh, weekend and we'll see you later. Take care. Thank you.